and follow me. That's the one thing he lacked. And Jesus knew it. He lacked the freedom to follow Jesus. This guy doesn't have a money problem. He's got a freedom problem. You see that? He doesn't have a money problem. He has a freedom problem. And here's, here's what's so important to understand as, as we look at this. Some of you hear this story and you, and you start to tune out because you say, thank goodness this isn't me. This isn't my story. I don't struggle with money. I don't have a stinginess problem. I am not rich. I don't have great possessions. I don't str- struggle with any of this, et cetera, et cetera. But in reality, you have the exact same problem that the rich young man has. You have a freedom problem. We all have a freedom problem. We're all held captive by something. And in a general sense, we call that sin. But very specifically, it plays out in a million ways in our lives. It's unique to each of us. So take a closer look again. When we think of this rich young man, what what his actual issue is, it's not really his great possessions. We don't know what the issue is. It's just tied to his great possessions. But there's something underneath that. So why do the great possessions keep him from following Jesus? We're not sure. We're not sure why he can't sell them, why he won't sell them. There's something else underneath that, some motivation different than that. We're not sure. Uh, Let me say it this way. Uh, Not everybody that has a money problem has a gold problem. Do you know what I mean by that? Not everybody that's got a money problem has got a gold problem. Now, you might know people that have a gold problem. For some reason, they keep buying things made of gold. (laughs) A gold problem, at least how I define a gold problem, is they actually just really like money itself. They like the smell of money. They like the taste of money. (laughs) They like the look of it. That's a gold problem. That's only one type of money problem. There's so many other types of money problems. Money or wealth, it's a very interesting thing because it's just an abstract currency for that which represents everything else. It just represents something else. So first of all, let me just make this very clear. If, if, you, if you make, I looked this up, if you make $40,000 a year, which in our city is, you know, Plenty of people make more than that. But you would be the 33rd million 982,066th richest person in the world. Well, that's saying something in a world of 7.6 billion people. That puts you in the top half of a percentage of the world. So you probably got a gold problem, but you probably got another kind of money problem too. But whatever your income level, what we have to figure out is what is truly underneath the money problem. What is the freedom problem? What are you beholden to? What is the great desire that money represents to you? So so let me help us get to this deeper issue. Let me help us to ask this question. What does your money represent to you? So to get at this, I'm going to show you how the exact same hope statement could be tied to all sorts of different motivations, okay? So here's the hope statement. If I could only afford to live in this neighborhood, that's the hope statement. If I could only afford to live in this neighborhood. If I could only afford to live in this neighborhood, then I'd have a very cool house with air conditioning and three-car garage. This is because my money problem represents a possessions problem. I like stuff. Now, if I can only have this house in this neighborhood, other people will see me as successful, accomplished, hard worker, maybe even hip and trendy because I live in this neighborhood. This is because my money represents a status or an appearance problem in my life. If I could only afford to live in this neighborhood, it would mean that I could do what I want to do when I want to do it. And I'd be connected to other people that could increase my power. 
This is because our money represents control or power. If I could only live in this neighborhood, I'd be close to all sorts of great restaurants, fun nightlife, probably meet other really fun people who would probably invite me into their really fun experiences. Money represents experience, fun, adventure. If I only could live in this neighborhood, I'd feel safe and secure, and so would my kids. Money represents security, safety. If I could only live in this neighborhood, it would be confirmation that I've made a lot of great decisions over my life to get to this point, and it'd probably be a really smart investment. This is because your money represents confirmation of right decision making. If I could only afford to live in this neighborhood, then I could use all this extra space in my house to help others, could really be connected with the neighborhood and the PTA. My money's represented to my helpfulness. I like to use my money to help. So maybe for some of these, you scoff at them. Others might hit close to home. The reality is the same money could represent so many different things depending upon what motivates you and drives you. So we could all have a money problem for very different reasons. And we don't know exactly what the money problem was for the rich young man, why he couldn't sell it to follow Jesus. But at the end of the day, we know this for sure, it held him captive. He had something in his life that stole his freedom, and he missed out on eternal life with Jesus. It's a sad story. And part of the reason the Bible again and again and again instructs us to be generous with our money, to hold it loosely, is because when we are generous, when we learn a pattern, a habit of giving, It begins to dig deeper and it forces us to come to terms with that which truly motivates us. That which holds us captive. And money becomes this really great spotlight, this magnifying glass that helps us figure it out. Why is it so hard for me to give? You're in the top half percent of the world in wealth. Why is it so hard? Because there's something that it represents that is holding you captive. And every month that I choose to give, it's a chance for me to say again, that thing does not own me. That thing does not represent my God. I choose to serve Jesus. That's why we give regularly, consistently. Because we have to keep rustling with these things that no matter where you're at in your walk with Jesus will continue to try to steal you back. Jesus says, one thing you lack, freedom. Jesus says, turn from that false currency and grab hold of the only true and lasting currency that extends from now into eternal life and that's a relationship with me. What does your money represent? I mean, I, maybe just write it down right now. I'm going to list off some things. Just write it down. Just be honest. What's, what's the point in pretending? <laughs> if you're a slave to it, don't you want to be free? What does it represent to you? Adventure? Security? Predictability? Autonomy? Control? Power? Pleasure? Happiness? Status, helpfulness, spontaneous, spontaneity, better stuff, bigger stuff, newer stuff, faster stuff, slower stuff. I don't know. What is it? What does it represent to you? None of this stuff is inherently bad stuff. What's bad is that it steals your freedom to follow Jesus which is the greatest thing that we're ever offered in our life, a chance to follow Jesus. Verse 23, And Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. This isn't like, wow, these are great words. It's like they were amazed, shocked. I can't believe he's saying this. 
But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter my kingdom. Now this word children here, he's wanting us, Mark, to think back to the story that Jesus told right before this story. So look at verse 13 with me. It's the story, right? Uh, that precedes the rich young man. It says this, And they were bringing children to Jesus that he might touch them, and, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant, and he said to them, Let the children come to me. Do, you not, do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying hands on him. So when he says, children, he's saying, remember what just happened, what I just said about children are the ones that enter the kingdom. Now, that just doesn't mean that you only get in if you're under 16. What it means here is that children represented those who were the most dependent people in society. And guess what? The rich are the least dependent. That's why I say the hardest thing for a rich person to do is to be as dependent as a child. And here's why. Because they've literally forgotten what it's like to depend on other people for anything. If you've ever met I mean, we're all rich, so we struggle with depending on people. But if you've ever met really wealthy people, you realize it's been a long time since they've depended on anybody. When they haven't paid to get out of a problem. When they've literally had to wait for a solution to show itself. You know what? And we're not that different. <laughs> It's also because wealthy people have had lots of other people rely on them. And time and time again, these other people's dependence on them has left a bitter taste in their mouth. And they say, I'll never be like that. Never again. I've worked too hard to ever have to leave a bitter taste in someone's mouth. But here's the problem. If you don't know how to be dependent, you can never receive the grace of God. It's the only way to salvation. You can't do it. You have to depend upon Jesus hanging for your sin on the cross. It's the only way. There's no plan B. It's the only way. You have to be dependent. And that's so hard when you're wealthy. So does this mean that wealthy people are all doomed? I don't think so. Jesus says here, what's impossible for man is not impossible for God. He can change anyone's heart from one of independence to one of dependence. But it's going to be real hard. Now, since we're rich too, each and every one of us in this room, we've probably got a dependence issue. And so we need to help God teach us to be dependent by doing what I call dependency practices. If you've been friends with me, you've maybe seen me try some of these at times, okay? Here, here's one of my favorite. Next time you go on a trip, now some of you are going to be like, I do this all the time. You might have an independency problem and you need to get a job, okay? <laughs> but next time you go on a trip, if you tend to always get a hotel room no matter what, and you can afford a nice hotel room, Here's what I want you to do. Withhold the urge for autonomy. And I want you to find a local connection. And you can probably find one, even if it's a distant connection, and it'd be really awkward. And I want you to stay in that person's house, on their couch. And I want you to pay them anything. I'm not talking Airbnb here. I'm talking somebody who doesn't get paid that just lets you sleep in their house. It's practicing dependency. Uh, or what about this? Some of you are like me, and you like being helpful and taking people to the airport, but you do not like asking other people to take you to the airport, and you'll walk if you have to before you'll ask for help. Next time you've got a flight, no matter how early, 
Don't, don't, don't hire an Uber. I want you to depend on a friend. And I don't want you to pay them either. I don't want you to bring them coffee or breakfast sandwich. I just want you to accept their generosity, their grace in your life, and go. I'm going to practice dependency right now. Uh, me and my wife have a flight tomorrow. We're headed down to California. Does anybody want to take me to the airport? 11 o'clock. Practicing dependency publicly. Talk to me after the service. Okay. <laughs> Probably need to leave my house around 10. Okay. Nothing wrong with using your platform for the, the greater good. Okay. Uh, you're welcome, Allie. She, she's probably left by now. Okay. Here, here's, here's a, here's, if you like to control and make all the decisions, here's what I want you to do on your next trip. Or, or actually on your next car ride. Let your spouse drive. On your next trip, let your kids pick everything that you're going to do. No questions asked, no tinkering, no subliminal messaging. Just let somebody else plan the whole thing and just enjoy it. This is practicing dependency because for some of us, it's so hard to rely on somebody else, but it's the basis of our faith. If we can't learn to depend upon the goodness and generosity of God shown to us through Jesus Christ on the cross and in the resurrection, we'll stay religious and diligent just like the rich young ruler but we'll miss out on salvation. We'll miss out on relationship with God because it only happens through dependency. Begin to train yourself so that when the chance comes and you see the truth of the gospel, you see the reality of Jesus, you can just give up what you need to give up to follow him. Verse 22, disheartened by Jesus saying, the rich young ruler went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't question Jesus. He doesn't say, uh, could you clarify this for me? Let me just kind of ask you about the parameters here. He doesn't start to argue theologically with Jesus. He just walks away. Why is that? Because he knows exactly what Jesus has said. And he knows exactly how captive he is to his possession. And you know what? He decides, I love that stuff more than this eternal life. You see, he came looking for eternal life, but he wanted it as an add-on. And Jesus says, I don't do add-ons. I'm not an add-on. I'm a get rid of that life and start a new life kind of guy. You see that? The guy knew exactly what was going on. He wasn't confused. He just knew he wasn't willing to give whatever motivation, whatever thing was represented by his possessions. He couldn't give it up. Because, you know, deep down, I think it was his identity. His identity was as the rich young man. And it was too much to give that away to follow Jesus. The rich aren't without hope. But with man, it's impossible. Only with God is it possible. Because what's happening when we choose to follow Jesus is something supernatural. It requires radical identity change. So let me explain this. Um, this is the good news. If you keep reading and, and studying about Jesus, he doesn't ask everybody to give everything away. Some people he just says gives part of it away. Some people he says, actually, I want you to go invest this and make more money for yourself. So, so it's only very seldom, really this one time, does he ask somebody to give everything away. Okay? Now I'm about to jack you up. If when you heard me say that, you took a deep breath, it means that this story is probably written for you. If, and I took a deep breath when I read this. Because what it means is whatever that thing that, that, that's underneath money, whatever money represents for you, it means that thing has seeped into your identity. And the only way to get rid of that is to kill that old identity to take on the new identity in Jesus. 
What's your identity wrapped up in? Is it your title, your degree, your career, your sexuality, your philosophical system, your politics, your family name, your morality, your trophy case, or maybe your bank account? What is it for you? If you took a deep sigh, oh, good, he doesn't ask everybody to do that. You might have an identity issue. Jesus came and told you that you had to give up the old identity if you wanted to follow him and take a new identity. It's an exchange, not an add-on. Will you do it? Because money and the security of money and the significance of money in my life and the reason that I went into accounting, the reason that I got a master's degree, the reason that I went and took the best job in the industry that I could with the best firm that had the best reputation, because that was so tied up in who I was and for so long had been and become a part of my identity, for me, I had to step completely out of the world of accounting. I mean, my mother begged me to stay in accounting and just do ministry on the side. And I said, Mom, I can't. My identity is too tied in it. And for years, she said, don't do that, because she was worried about me. But I had to get out of it. In fact, I had to leave Dallas, where all my friends who were making more and more money, because it really got to me. But I had to separate myself, because it was so deep in me. For, for others, I mean, maybe it's you have to leave that whole world. Maybe, maybe for some of you, you need to go cold turkey on travel and vacation. Because if you dip your toe in that temptation, it's too easy to fall back under the spell of an old lover. For others, you might need to purposefully move out of a safe neighborhood into a less safe neighborhood to realize that God is your protector. I don't know what it is, but this identity stuff is deep and it takes severe radical, supernatural work to give that up and to follow Jesus. Now look at this. Uh, Final thing here. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything. We followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Now let me just tell you, this is the hundredfold principle. And he's talking about in this world. Now don't worry, I'm not going to get, you know, prosperity gospel on you. But this is how it works. If you give up those things to follow Jesus, immediately you get the family of God at your disposal. That's the principle. So you know what? I travel anywhere in the country, and I assume if there's a believer in that country, I've got a house to stay in. Probably something nicer than a four-star hotel. Because I'm a part of the family of God. You know what? I've got brothers there and sisters there and mothers there, and I probably own some land there because I'm a part of the kingdom of God. Right now, when you follow Jesus, you get everybody that's connected to him. That's the principle. So it's not like if you give $100 to the church, you'll get $1,000 back. That's not how it works. So much better than that. So much better than that. We've titled this series, The Most Important Question Ever Asked, which we see in Mark 8 that Jesus asks of all of us. Jesus says this to us, who do you say that I am? And Jesus asked the rich young ruler the same question. Am I Lord over your finances? And he couldn't say yes. And he misses out. He misses out on life to the full. Let's pray. Father God, we're so... uh, We're so wrapped up in this. I mean, we can't go through a day without having money come up. It's such a part of our life and our culture and the way everything works, God. God, I just ask that you forgive me as 
pastor of this church, God, that I, that I haven't spoken more about this. Because even as I speak of it now, I realize how important this issue is. This is a discipleship issue. To follow Jesus means to talk about this because it's so wrapped up in everything we are and do. And we want to give that all to you. Jesus, help us to start a conversation with you about what money might represent in our life and and why we cling to it. So you're standing there, you're asking us this question. Are you going to ask me, you say this to us, are you going to ask me what to do with your money? Or are you going to ask everybody else? Jesus says, are you going to ask me? God, help us to ask you how to use our money. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, have somebody to teach you what it meant to be generous. So I say that, and, and, and you have a million things. You're like, I have no idea. So what we have done is we've put together a little packet, and we'll pass it out later. It's just a little four-page that explains some principles to giving. What is tithing? Should we tithe as Christians? It's a frequently asked question. So we're just going to give you, and you can wrestle with the scriptures yourself. And um, I, I, re- I mean, I, I realized this. I was thinking like, one day Grayson's going to come and ask me, he says, Dad, I really like this girl. What do I do? I've never liked a girl before. Uh, what should I get her? I want to get her a gift for her birthday, you know. And the things that he would come up with on his own, they probably wouldn't be all that great. He needs to ask me. <laughs> you know, okay, don't give her Batman Lego. And she, unless she loves Lego Batman, Okay. Get, get her something else, bro. <laughs> well, there's always, you know, more, there's more fish in the sea. Okay, so we're going to give you this packet, and it's going to explain this tithe, which literally means te- a tenth. And, and it's this thing that, 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 that we see all throughout the Bible, and, and it seems like, and, and I'll just give you some highlights, it seems like what Jesus says is that that is sort of the baseline. And he always calls his disciples to something even more. Now, when I say that, many of you are like, tenth is the, is the floor. That's how I used to be. So here's what I want. want maybe, maybe this is a good way to think about it. We want to be moving towards a biblical understanding of generosity and giving. But it might take us a while to get there. So what would it look like to start at 5% and say, over the next five years, I'm going to increase my giving by 1% to the mission of God? And we talk about it in here. Uh, it starts with the local church, but it doesn't include, only, it's not limited to the local church. We're also going to do a class starting in January called Financial Peace University. Because for some of you, your finances are a mess. And it's not just going to be being generous that's going to fix it. You need to do some real work and learning how to find holistic financial health. We're not going to teach that. We're going to bring in somebody that's way smarter than us to teach that. And then, I, and then, and then I would ask you to think about what does it look like to set up recurring giving. You can do that online or through the app, but there's something about consistent recurring giving that's so important. Because it's the first fruits. It's not like, well, if I've got some left over. But this is what I'm giving to the mission of God before I give to anything else. And and so to set something like that, super easy. There's instructions in this if you're not super savvy with the technology. And we're doing this all because we want you to have your heart set free. We We want you to be able to move beyond the normal into this supernatural joy of generosity. Okay. We're so happy to talk about this and answer questions, and we realize this isn't super exciting, (laughs) but I guarantee you, you'll experience more life if you can figure this question out than maybe any other question, because we live in a world that is saturated by this idea of money. So as you prepare to come to this table. We do this every week at Sedaris. We remember uh, that we are saved by grace alone through faith in the death and the resurrection of Jesus alone. That's the only thing that saves us. 
not what we do with our money. That's just a response to the generosity of Jesus, that when we see what he gives to Mm -hmm. us freely, unconditionally, with no strings attached, when we see that, we can't help but respond by giving of all of ourselves. So if you are trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of sin, if you've received salvation through Jesus, if you're connecting to him in relationship by his blood and his body, then you come to this table, you'll rip off a piece of the bread, you'll dip it in the cup, and you'll eat it, saying, I'm uniting to Jesus in every way, with every part of me, for his mission, for his kingdom, for now until the rest of my days. So I give to you what I also received. The night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, said, this is my body broken for you. And then he took the cup and said, this is the cup of my new covenant. He said, as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So when you're ready, come and have fellowship with Jesus. Um, There's stations at both sides. uh, And then we will pass out this little helpful FAQ. What does tithing mean? Because we want you to read it. We, want, we, want, we spent some time. We want you to have at least the information so that you're not rustling in ignorance, but you're rustling with the word of God. What does it look like to be a follower of Jesus in this area of my life? So when you're ready, come and worship Jesus through the bread and the cup.